Hi, Sushant. Hi, Sushant. Can you hear me? Yes. So we are starting now. I'm not muted now. Uh, no, but I'm going to mute you now. So when I call I can hear for you, but it's very strange. Mets? Could you switch the dishwasher off? Just pull it together. With the kind permission of Mr. DDG, um, Sir Sri uh, Srivastava, Sir, we can start. Srivastava, Sir, are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hmm. Ah, now I can hear you also. Yes. Okay, so where do we go from here? Just one minute. We are waiting for uh, Sri Suresh Prabhuji to just uh, join in. In fact, his office is already joined in. Hmm. And uh, in just about a minute, we can start as soon as uh, we have uh, Prabhu Saab here. I'm, I'm already there. I'm Suresh Prabhu here. Oh, yes. Hello. Good evening to you, sir. Such a pleasure to I, have you. I have the bad habit of coming in time, always. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic habit and it uh, keeps us uh, on toes. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? Pardon? So, um, so with your kind permission, we will start. I can't see Mr. Prabhu. Hmm. He is here. He is a little dark, now. Nah? So, how are you? This is Pralad. The great imaginative person. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> how of course, have you been? Because we are not met for a long time, it has deprived me of an opportunity to admire you again. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We are great admirers of yours. <laughs> So, with your kind permission, um, I'm Sushma Morthania, Director General India SME Forum, and I take the pleasure of inviting our chief guest, uh, Sri Suresh Prabhu, and uh, um, all the esteemed speakers of today on behalf of India SME Forum. I welcome each one of you to this international conference for intellectual property global value chains. This conference is being organized by the Center of Intellectual Property for Promotion, Facilitation and Research, which is an arm, IP facilitation center arm of India SME Forum. India SME Forum is primarily a not-for-profit organization founded since 2011. And since then, we are currently um, 86,400 member strong, all MSMEs from manufacturing and service uh, category, of which 7,000 plus are women entrepreneurs. The whole objective of this conference today is to amplify the message of uh, why intellectual property, why it is so important uh, uh, especially after the clarion call of our honorable uh, prime minister local to uh, global and why Indian brands need to go global. And while we are opening to the world and uh, welcoming uh, other companies uh, from across the world to India, it is so important to safeguard 
our brands as well as safeguard incoming brands which want to come to india so uh, having said that um, uh, this conference is being supported by the Hello. office of development commissioner of msmp and unido as the uh, implementing agency for this intellectual property rights scheme which is run by the development commissioners office india sme forum uh, will enable empower and facilitate small and medium enterprises to go for trademark to go for patents to go for geographical indications and will be facilitating this whole process under the scheme of intellectual property of uh, the office of development commissioner of msme uh 10000 rupees is reimbursed for trademark uh, uh 1 lakh is reimbursed for domestic patent up to 5 lakhs is reimbursed for international patent and up to 2 lakhs is reimbursed for geographical indication with that um i once again welcome all of you to this international conference especially our chief guest um sri suresh prabhu uh, honorable uh, indian sherpa to the g20 former union commissioner uh, union minister for commerce and industry he has been uh, rajya sabha former union union minister for uh, commerce and industry railways and civil aviation as part of pm shri m uh, shri narendra modi's cabinet he has served as industry minister minister for environment and forest grateful ha huh? minister of fertilizers and chemicals power heavy industry and public enterprises from 1998 to 2004 as part of former uh, pm shri atal bihari bajpayee's cabinet he is a four time elected member yes. of parliament to the lok sabha and twice to the rajya sabha we welcome you sir with utmost pleasure and privilege of having you here today may i request may i request uh, shri um, uh, dhananjay prasad uh, shrivastava secretary minister general of dc msme office ministry of msme to kindly uh, welcome our chief guest with a few words uh, this intellectual property uh, scheme is run as a part of the credit link subsidy scheme which is headed by shrivastava sir Shivastava sir, may okay. may have you on, please. Hello. Oh, can you hear me, madam? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, I think my video is no, uh, uh, can't see me. It's not there. My face is not coming. No. So can you can I start? Can I start? Yes, please, sir. Ah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Ah, uh, I am DP Shivastava, Deputy Director General, looking after IPR scheme in. I'm DC of or DC office of uh, Ministry of MSME. Is Ahmedabad and one is uh, SME. Up concept, uh, concept. At present, whole world is passing through very difficult phase. I log on because it. of uh, coronavirus, and MSME sector is also badly affected. I hope the package announced by Indian government would help in revival of Indian MSME. MSME is an important sector of Indian economy. if you see the national sample survey data then in country we have uh, 63.4 million msme which provide employment to 110 million people this sector provides maximum number of employment in the country after agriculture the share of msme in gdp is about 30% and the share of msme in export is about 49% this data shows the size of the sector and also its impact on our economy but at the same time there are many challenges in the sector for example access to finance access to market access to technology and at present we are fighting the menace of covid-19 also for improving competitiveness of msme sector we have uh, several schemes in the ministry 
and intellectual property right scheme of ministry is one of them under this scheme we provide various incentive to encourage ipr registration and also for establishment of ip facilitation center but if we compare the registration of ipr in india with countries like china japan and south korea then it is very very low which will be at present international trade is largely affected by counterfeit and pirated products including internet based product distribution the counterfeiting and piracy of products particularly pharmaceutical pharmaceutical products involves the deception to patient healthcare service providers and suppliers of genuine products this is a more serious problem especially in the period when whole world is fighting the menace of corona virus there is a need to enhance interaction between indian msme association ministry of msme wipo unido and other stakeholders for formulating a strategy for preventing piracy counterfeit and also for encouraging registration so far msme sector in india is benefited only to a very limited extent from the expertise and knowledge of wipo unido and other similar agencies therefore active cooperation between ministry of msme wipo unido and other stakeholders like msme industry associations is very very important in this connection i propose that for the benefit of msme sector we should have a group consisting of members from the ministry of msme dpit unido and industry association thank you very much um uh, thank you very much sir for setting the context for uh, uh today's program and uh, uh, giving us a way forward may i request our chairman uh, mr prahlad kakkar to welcome our chief guest and our esteemed uh, speakers and panelists of the day good evening mr prabhu mr shivasan and all the speakers of this conference can you hear me yes very much yes yes how can you hear me yeah okay um I, mr prabhu and me go back a long way the first time i ever met him was he landed up on my island in lakshadweep where we were all set up to go for a dive and in comes mr prabhu and says what a beautiful island we need to protect this <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ever since then uh, we've had a kind of a, a love affair because anybody who cares for the environment is a friend of mine and we we were, we had the privilege of being on an island in lakshadweep which is a coral island beautiful fragile small uh, usse acha island to kabhi maine zindagi mein photograph mein bhi nahi dekha absolutely correct mm. i agree with you so from then onwards we always kept in touch and we've always been on and off on many forums and i welcome him today in this very unique forum here today because what mr shivastav has said about plagiarizing about copying about copycatting about uh, taking a name like uh, an international brand and making a cheap copy of it and getting away with it in certain markets especially when you are in the hinterland and the court cases that then ensue go on for years and years and years luckily the 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 registration act at least has made them stop copying but any given successful pharmaceutical brand whether it's a toothpaste or whether it's a it's, it's a, an aspirin or whether it's anything that is not on prescription is actually being plagiarized by every halwai ke dukan and being sold in in small little towns and villages where it becomes very difficult to actually track them down to figure out exactly what is going on now intellectual rights property uh has two aspects to it one is the business of protecting your brand if it is a brand uh from being plagiarized by others because it's successful and you have spent a lot of money in advertising and publicity so that people have a certain trust and faith in it and then when somebody plagiarizes it and and sells it under your your brand name it is it it really hurts the the company because you have invested in that name you have invested in the technology 
you have invested maybe in the r&d and maybe it's a unique product and therefore when people just copy the name and put some junk into it and you get a bad name in the market because people turn around and say it's not impactful it's not effective it's a bad product and then they come and bring it back to you and you realize that it's a fake product then it becomes a huge rigmarole and we need to figure out a way to streamline how to protect an intellectual property like a brand name or a patent name or a or a, or a registered name which is which is known not necessarily nationally not necessarily internationally but is known within the region because there are lots of brands that actually sell only within the state and especially in states like haryana which has a huge sme what you call uh, conflicts and especially in places where you manufacture toothpaste where you manufacture analgesics where you manufacture anything and you spend money on them then it becomes a really huge nuisance i, I know any pharmaceutical company today in this country small or big which is a bona fide company has at least five to six court cases on their hands right now at this very moment to try and stop uh, the, the pilfering of their product name with some substandard product in some place but having said that uh, what my uh, since we are talking to SME, smes the main thing is that we have not actually built a brand to even register the patent and we been talking especially our forum has been very strong on telling our members that invest in building a brand because that's where the value is that's where they lack there's no deterioration as a matter of fact there's no depreciation either it goes from strength to strength the other day i was uh talking to a, a whole bunch of jewelers who we were trying to get to make brands out of their name because they do job work and they supply jewelry like you supply potatoes or onions to some what do you call uh, uh to some uh, uh person uh, uh abroad who, who puts a brand on it and sells it under his brand name with huge markups so i've been telling them you start a brand name so they told me i said what about tanish tanish is one of the few companies that is actually in the jewelry business which has actually got itself a brand so they came and told me that you know tanish when it started making all these fancy new kinds of jewelry which were not necessarily accepted in our marriage market which is the biggest market for jewelry in india uh, they said that they lost uh, approximately 60 uh, crores a year uh, to try and sell the new style of jewelry with 18 karat gold instead of 22 karat gold or 24 karat gold so he says see they they also lost so they couldn't build their brand they built their brand but they lost money so i said how many years did they lose money so he says four years i said then they made it up now they're making money he says yes but then that's because they've also got a line of traditional jewelry that is why they're making money so i said what is their brand value today what if the name tanish was to be sold in the market how much would you offer them so very scaredly he says 5000 crores so i said where 60 crores of loss for 5 years versus 5000 crores of valuation which you give me it's probably 50000 crores in terms of real value so if you are going to patent a brand if you are going to register a brand not only nationally but also internationally then you must first develop the brand there are so many companies in india today who are capable of making an international level brand but who have never thought of making an international brand there is not a single international indian brand today except yoga sachin tendulkar tell me one other brand which is purely indian and indigenized which is known outside of india in the world today other than these things that i have told you and those are those you can't patent anyway so uh, if you don't build a brand of some international value there is going to be no point in this entire conversation so when you patent something when you protect an intellectual right first you have to develop it put in r and d into it make it unique and then turn around and patent and say this is ours today Uh, americans are trying to patent haldi they trying to patent neem they trying to patent 
indigenous thing. They, they were trying to pay, patent Basmati. They were trying to patent uh, what do you call Dajiling tea. But we fought them at a national level. We fought them from government to the patenting rights and we managed to get the regional patents for those, uh, uh, those products, which are natural products. Everybody uses them. We've been using Haldi for th thousands of years. So until you get up and are aware of what it is to protect your natural uh, heritage, as well as your brand name, you have to first start making a brand name before you start protecting it. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, giving those examples and setting the context. Um, of course, we are uh, the whole exercise today is to, uh, you know, uh, continue building awareness regarding IPR, and we want to continue this exercise from now on here, because uh, we are aware that we don't have enough patent lawyers, we don't have enough IPR lawyers and trademark lawyers, and the entire process of registration is also slow in India. So of course, that is one of the challenge. Having said that, we would like to uh, hear from our chief guest here today and uh, some insights and uh, guidance and direction from our chief guest, Sri Suresh Prabhuji. May I uh, have the pleasure of welcoming you and uh, to speak, sir. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, my dear friend, one of the great uh, imagination person of the country, Mr. Pavlat Kaka for being there as well as uh, being sharing this such an important forum. And of course, Director General, thank you very much. Also happy that Mr. Srivastava is supporting this. And I can see so many distinguished panelists will be speaking after me. And therefore, I really welcome all of them uh, to this very interesting program. You know, while uh, this is such a topical issue, let me divide my talk into three, four aspects. Because just what my dear friend Pallad said, I'm just reacting to it, as well as some of the ideas which you mentioned. I'm just reacting to all of that. One is, uh, at a time like this, and the economy is in trouble, the global economy is in trouble, and the virtual effect of all that is on the SMEs. They're at the receiving end. So the challenge is, how do you build SMEs? So one, there are many reasons, and I, I've spoken on it many times, including at the Unido Forum only recently, a few days ago. So I let me focus on IPR part of it. Normally, SMEs by definition are small. You can increase the size of definition, but still as compared to the larger businesses, they are small businesses. So the challenge for SME is how do you build a business model? One way to build a business model is to work under some large businesses. So if there is a large tree, the smaller trees can come up under the shades of a large tree. It's called undergrowth. So that's one business model. And we are seeing that business model succeeding also. Like companies becoming suppliers as ancillaries, as components to large businesses. So that's one business model. But then there is, could be another business model, which is knowledge-based businesses. You can build your business based on your very intrinsic, unique, identical identity of knowledge. And that identity could be built in a way that it becomes very unique to you. Nobody can say that I can also do it. You can do it and you make it better. Now taking example because Prahlad mentioned about pharmaceuticals. Let us take pharmaceutical industry. Either you can have a loan licensee model in which you make medicine for a large brand and you just get paid for the conversion charges. Then you could have a reverse engineering model that you make generic drugs from something which the patent which has gone out of shelf. So you can do reverse engineering, change process and do it. But a third in same pharmaceutical could be that you can de develop your own molecule. Now, if you look at same business in pharmaceutical, the first, you can have volumes, but no profit margin. It's second, little better profit margin, but in the third, the profit margin can be huge because that's where you are putting entire knowledge. You're developing molecule. 
you are registering a patent and therefore you make lot of money in that so to do that the sme is willing to think about a new business model whether we should be doing only contract manufacturing or we should do for getting into higher value addition by doing knowledge driven businesses we need both it's not that we have to do either of the two but intellectual property right driven businesses ipr driven businesses will have a better profit margin let's take one other example if you are manufacturing a product as a contract manufacturer you can make x but if you are also designing a product then you can get not x x square but probably even more because you are now capturing a value chain at a level where there is a maximum value addition there is a maximum money value addition that happen so getting a business model for a small business enterprises is very critical in this very difficult times for the sme sector yes. so if you can build a business around knowledge or ideas you can make much more money so now to do that you have to work on designing a product you have to think about business ideas all technology companies actually started very small in india as well as globally the best brands known globally today were very small companies very very small some of them started in garage what it means that they didn't have anything else except idea they were in garage but their mind was full of opportunities they could think very big though the small area of operation was very small so we have to think about small is a is a limiting factor when you are talk about production for a particular level but small is a fertile ground for coming out with new ideas if a new ideas can get born there itself so therefore now we have to build up model around a intellectual property the second part is the geographical indication that you talked about yes but i was as a minister of commerce and industry we started this in a big way a campaign for geographical indicator i started one shop in goa airport because i was also the minister for aviation in fact i decided that time all 100 airports in india would have one geographical indication shop because that will provide employment to local people yes i you mention about i being a four time lok sabha mp from konkan the alfonso mangoes are the mangoes which are grown only in that area but if you don't have geographical indication how will you get it basmati is a geographical indication if you don't register it how will you get it so registering a brand registering an idea registering a naturally designed product given to us by nature is something which gives you a lot of value to it so therefore we have to work on it the third aspect of it is related to patents and oral ip india has actually a robust intellectual property rights system which is trips compatible as you know the trips uh, trade related intellectual property rights system which is part of our we are part of a secretary to that we have made a law into that if i go right that patent laws were patent registration were taking a lot of time yes. we modernized the entire patent office it was under me and we made sure now that we are reduced the time limit considerably and now we we should be working on it even more but that is an issue which was an issue which you try to address but if you don't register an ipr you lose as you mentioned but respecting ipr is very important Yes. because if you don't respect ipr what is the value to that ipr nothing yes. if i make a film and you can see that film in a pirated form even before it is released then i lose all everything that i have made my my entire creative value is gone so yes. therefore we are working on administering intellectual property right very effectively and that again was our one of our thrust area i am can go on and on but i can see so many speakers so let me tell you one thing that in my then cabinet position my first ministry at that time very wajpi was ministry of industry and that time the industry ministry had was not a fragmented like today even smes was part of that ministry yes the dipp was part of that ministry the uh, entire dp was part of that ministry at that time smes i had prepared in my short stay in that ministry at that time though i became industry minister subsequently twice after that i had actually worked on working for smes rejuvenation which is an ongoing process which we are still doing and prime minister modi is focusing on it i think it's a very good conference at a time when prime minister modi has given this clarion call of making local brands global and i think that will go a long way but if you make designing 
and then manufacture you make more money if you design on a intellectual property basis you can make much more money if you can do something which is so different than others you can even make even more money so i think the challenge is not just to do business in smes but to now make it knowledge based ideas based which are can be protected through an intellectual property right regime and we should try to take it forward so thank you very much for inviting me and i please be assured of complete support from me for this idea and whenever you call me i'll be available to take this idea forward to help my small and medium enterprises friends because they are the backbone of india's economy they are the ones who support the economy of india as a whole so we must support them and we should try to work with them please count on my support thank you very much for inviting me all the best to you thank you so much thank you very much sir for coming and sharing such valuable uh, insights and opinion and thank you for giving us that honor and privilege also sir to call you any time we need because of course we want to continue this conference at a much uh, grander level because this is just the first step today and we want intellectual property rights to be uh, uh, percolated right to the last mile connectivity or the you know the last entrepreneur that we say and i am very glad to also mention here that india sme forum is also the implementing agency for industrial design clinic prototyping also an incubation center so we um, also help entrepreneurs in uh, building their ideas help them for business acceleration as well and facilitating for ip and creating ip so thank you very much sir for your time once again and thank you, uh, yes thank you, you sir. thank you bye 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 thank you bye sir that was suresh prabhu um, uh, honorable uh, india's uh, sherpa to g20 and uh, with that we mark uh, the beginning of our international conference and i would like to now uh, invite our first speaker of the evening Mr Yan Minier chief economist from European Patent Office <clears throat> uh, good evening everyone good evening to you Mr Minier um uh, uh, Mr Yan Minier is joined uh, EPO as chief economist in 2016 and has many years of extensive experience of providing economic insights into issues relating to patents innovation and economic growth and contributes high level of expertise and analysis to public and expert forums on a regular basis he has also led the chair, chair on ip and markets for technology at minds paris tech where he was previously also a professor of economics so over to you mr minier Thank you. So good. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. It's a real pleasure to to participate in this event. And Uh, Mr. Minier, you are on mute, so you will need to unmute your mic. Okay, there I am. Yes, Thanks. we can hear you now. Yeah, thank you. So um, I, I was saying that uh, I'm uh, very glad to be uh, to participate in this event and thankful for the invitation. I'm glad also to uh, uh, speak uh, about the topic of uh, small and medium uh, businesses because it's a topic of importance for the EPO, and uh, we have been carrying out a, a number of studies on this topic uh, in the past years on behalf of the office, uh, and uh, I think it's a great opportunity to share some insights. Uh, on our key results uh, uh, highlighting the the importance uh, of these small and business uh, uh, sm uh, small and medium businesses to the economy and the importance of uh, intellectual property rights uh, for the growth of these businesses so without further ado let me let me go into the statistics 
selected statistics from, from recent studies. And uh, let me start with uh, that one. Uh, it's a study we do uh, uh, regularly in cooperation with the uh, uh, European Union Intellectual Property Office, which is in charge of trademarks and designs at the EU level, and uh, where we assess uh, the performance uh, of businesses that make use of intellectual property. And uh, we find as a consistent result that uh, businesses that use IP are more performant in terms of uh, revenue per employee. Uh, and, but uh, what is really striking is that this difference is particularly strong in the case of small businesses. Uh, you see here that uh, large companies have uh, on average 4% higher uh, revenue per employee, uh, but in the case of SMEs, it's plus 31%. So it's absolutely massive. And that shows really uh, a big fundamental differences between small businesses in general and those that make use of intellectual property and of course, the reason for that is not that uh, they have filed a patent. Uh, it's that these small businesses that make use of intellectual property are innovative. They develop, they generate intellectual assets that can be protected and that, that have to be protected with patents, trademarks, designs. And uh, it's thanks to their innovativeness that they are more performant economically. One possible other explanation for this high performance of uh, small businesses that use IP is that only rich small businesses can afford to use IP. So it could also be uh, uh, the re a result, not a cause, the, the fact of uh, uh, innovative and using IP. And that's the reason why we need to dig deeper to, to understand uh, this, uh, this very high performance of uh, IP using small businesses. And one way to do that uh, is to focus uh, uh, on the category of so-called high growth firms, which is a, a keyword uh, uh, for policymakers, uh, especially uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, the one definition for these high growth firms is that it's companies that uh, sustain a, a, a growth of uh, at least 10% during three consecutive years. So it's quite a high threshold. And uh, why are these high growth firms particularly interesting? Uh, because they are those that drive economic growth. They create job, uh, jobs, they create wealth, they increase the GDP. And uh, to do that, they are typically geared towards international growth, so rapid scale up based on innovation, based on the intellectual assets. So they are typically the kind of uh, entities that are of high interest for policymakers, but also that the, the, the IP system should support. So in, a, in another study with the EU Intellectual Property Office, we have been looking at SMEs and try to identify those that would become later high growth firms. And to be more precise, we took a, a, a random sample of small and medium businesses in Europe, uh, and we checked whether they had been using intellectual property rights, whatever the type of intellectual property rights, and then we checked whether that was correlated somehow with their the success later on in terms of growth. And we find indeed a very strong correlation, which you can see here. Actually, small and medium businesses uh, that made prior use of intellectual property rights have a higher probability of growing subsequently. There's a plus 21% chance uh, of growing and even a 10 plus 10% 10 chance of becoming a high growth firm. So one of these uh, small group of highly performant SMEs. And the reason for that, again, is quite simple. It's not the fact, the mere fact of filing a trademark or a patent. It's because these small, the fact that these small businesses have been using intellectual property means they, they are innovative. And they are not only innovative, but smart enough to protect their innovation with intellectual property, which makes it possible to, to uh, uh, fully leverage uh, this innovation in the marketplace. Another interesting finding is that when we restrict our initial criteria uh, to European IP rights, so this in, the, in that case, we, we picked only those SMEs that have been using European patents or European trademarks, so intellectual property rights that are valid across Europe, across different countries, then we find an even, even stronger correlation, uh, plus 26% likelihood of growth and plus 17% likelihood of high growth. And again, that should not be a surprise 
it means that uh, these businesses, these small businesses that, that make use of interna in, uh, international property rights, here yeah, European intellectual property rights, are not only innovative, but also geared towards international growth. And that's the natural growth path for an innovative small business is to scale up at the international scale, which for European businesses, of course, means first the rest of the European Union. But for instance, for Indian small businesses, means possibly first the rest of Asia or the US or Europe. And in that case, international patent protection or IP protection uh, in a timely manner, so very soon, matters a lot. That's the key. So we, we see with these uh, uh, first results that uh, there is a, a strong uh, link between the use of intellectual property, in, uh, innovation, and the success of small businesses. But uh, still, uh, there's a need to dig deeper to better understand how exactly does IP make it possible uh, uh, to grow faster and to be more performant in the market. And uh, this is the reason why, as, as another study, uh, we have carried out uh, uh, last year a survey of uh, small businesses in Europe to understand how uh, th their ability to commercialize innovations protected by European patents. And I would like to share with you now some further insights uh, from this study. Uh, and the, the, the first insight is there on this slide. Usually intellectual property is associated with a, with a monopoly, with simply protecting uh, inventions or uh, intellectual creations from imitation. Uh, and definitely that is true. And you can see that here uh, for 83% uh, of the European SMEs that uh, filed European patents, preventing imitation is important. Uh, it's the main motive for using European patents, but that's not the only one. And this is my key point. Uh, intellectual property rights are not only about creating fences, there are also assets that can be used in a proactive way uh, to create, to develop business models, to build bridges for collaboration, uh, uh, to create value. And this uh, you can see in the other motives uh, cited by, by the SMEs. Uh, they use, uh, uh, actually a majority of them uh, use European patents and patents, so in general, for what I call transactional purposes. They use them to enhance their reputation. When you visit uh, a client and you want to convince that potential client that you have good technology, it's more convincing if you can show that this technology is uh, protected by a patent. It has passed a certain threshold of inventiveness and you can safely exploit it because it's legally protected. Likewise, uh, the, the, the patents are also used to create freedom to operate. So to secure uh, the business activity of the small businesses and to give them bargaining chips in, in case they have to access another entity's technology. Then they can cross license, for instance, using their patent portfolio. As a direct consequence of that, patents are used proactively by uh, more than half of these SMEs <coughs> to, to establish contracts. <coughs> so contracts may be licensing, that's the next item but it can also be contracts to set up research collaboration with other small businesses, with larger businesses, uh, with universities, contracts to supply, uh, supply uh, uh, products that embody the patented technology. And finally, contracts for financing, and that's the last item I, I would like to highlight, more than one third uh, of the uh, surveyed SMEs use patents uh, to raise funds, to raise uh, uh, finance. And again, that's a, that's a potentially a powerful collateral. That's a strong argument vis-a-vis -vis investors that there is valuable technology in the, in the small business and that this technology is safe because it is protected. So to, to wrap up this important slide in my view, uh, patents are definitely or intellectual property rights necess necessary for small businesses to protect their intellectual creations but they can and they should also be used proactively as an asset uh, to organize transactions and create value that way. When we, uh, if we look, if we dig a bit deeper in that point on transactions and look at the way in which uh, these uh, SMEs commercialize uh, their patents. So again, we are, we are looking at a sample of SMEs that have been filing European patents 
we see first that uh, two thirds of them uh, have succeeded in bringing their inventions to the market with the patents, uh, which is quite high actually. And the remaining third, it's usually because the, the uh, technology is still in development, but also interesting is that when the technology has been brought to the market, half of the time, uh, the SME did not do that alone, but do that uh, with external partners. And that's indeed a, a major characteristic of SMEs. We would not find the same results with large companies because SMEs are small entities. They are resource constrained. They lack some assets, for instance, for distribution, for manufacturing, for some complementary technology. And in order to scale up their activities and rapidly hit the market, they need to find partners. They need to establish collaboration for manufacturing, for distribution, for entering foreign markets, and so on. And when this commercialization endeavor is based on technology, it is absolutely fundamental in order, in order to be able to engage external partners and negotiate them on an even basis to have a strong IP protection as a starting point. So that's another very important uh, uh, takeaway uh, uh, message uh, in my view. So that's, uh, that's the, the, the general picture. If I, if I wrap up, there's a strong uh, correlation between the success uh, of small businesses, their innovation and their ability to capture, protect and proactively commercialize their uh, intellectual creations with intellectual property. Uh, for that, they need the skills, the knowledge to, to proactively use, uh, use patents or IP as a means for transaction and to engage uh, in these transactions with the right partners. So beyond the statistics, uh, that's a question of how, how to do that. What are the skills needed? What are the best practices? And uh, in our view at the European Patent Office, this is a bit the frontier of raising awareness uh, with small businesses. We need not only to inform them about the importance of IP, but we also need uh, to inform them uh, about how to best make use of IP once they have filed for IP. And it's in this spirit uh, that we have uh, initiated a collection of uh, case studies dedicated to SMEs, highlighting the different facets uh, in, of the ways in which uh, patents and IP uh, can be used uh, to create strategic value with questions such as uh, when to file for IP, how to use the IP, uh, uh, what kind of expertise should be involved. So I don't have uh, the time uh, to dig uh, deep into the, these case studies. There are many of them. You can, you can uh, see them uh, on our uh, website, uh, but uh, you have a few examples here. And uh, my colleague Jed Owens uh, will be uh, explaining more about them uh, later in the afternoon. And I think I'm over time already, right? So uh, if that's right, I will stop here. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Minier, for sharing that. And of course, yes, uh, we will be uh, sharing amongst our members as well as other uh, uh, MSMEs uh, who, are, who have participated today. In fact, uh, Today we have uh, um, in this uh, group, uh, this webinar, we have uh, 160 members, participants here and 700 plus have joined on Facebook. So this conference is already being uh, relayed uh, online as well. So we have that many MSMEs watching us. Um, may I now have the pleasure of uh, inviting our next uh, speaker, um, Dr. Reni Van Perkel, the UNIDO representative in India and also our partner uh, for this international conference today. Uh, Dr. Berkel heads, he's the, sorry, pardon me, I think I've lost the, sorry. Um, Dr. Berkel is UNIDO's representative in India and heads the regional office of UNIDO in India. He coordinates country offices in Afghanistan and Bangladesh. He has 30 years of professional experience in resource efficiency and cleaner production. 
industrial productivity and sustainability with extensive international experience in Europe, Australia and Asia, covering a variety of manufacturing and related sectors. Mr. Burkel is going to talk on innovation and the basics of intellectual property. Over to you, uh, Bur uh, Mr. Burkel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you indeed for uh, India SME Forum and for the DC's office for putting this together on uh, talking about uh, intellectual property and the, the role of MSMEs and also linking that to global value chains. I just want to check, is the slides uh, screen my screen visible? Yes, we can see. Okay, so then uh, I cannot 100% uh, see that. So I would like to, uh, to talk a bit on the innovation and then sort of also looking at the sub theme of the conference, which is also participation in global value chains. And I also would like to uh, reflect on uh, Mr. Shivatstava's uh, earlier comments and actually inviting, uh, let's uh, set up a, a working group or to, to dig down on, uh, on some of the issues that prevent uh, the use of intellectual property for MSME development. So happy to share that. But I will uh, focus a bit more on innovation as a driver for in intellectual property. So I'll talk less about the intellectual property, right, property rights itself, but more about the process and the needs for innovation to achieve manufacturing competitiveness and sustainability and participate in global value chains. So just for those who are less familiar, uh, UNIDO is working on inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So we, we, we're looking for in the industries that are as, as industrialization that works for markets so that we have productive uh, and competitive markets, that we have a quality product, that we're innovative, that the issues that we're talking about, but also that we look and uh, maintain uh, environmental quality, energy issues and, and related ones, so safeguarding the environment and also creating shared pros prosperity, which we normally see as decent work, but that's also a decent reward for the people who have invented something. So uh, giving a reward to designers or so is, is and, and uh, practicing uh, geographical indication, as was mentioned before, would certainly also be a reflection of this creating shared prosperity. So in India, we work on uh, basically four programs. So productive and resilient MSMEs is our core focus. And then we have uh, programs on environment, resources, and uh, climate, and then responsible value chains and strategic policy for industrial transformation. So I will talk a, a little bit, a link back to our initiatives on uh, uh, building back business from crisis, which together with the uh, India SME Forum is, uh, is partnering with us. And then also on the, on the low carbon innovation which is a, a case study basically on how innovation can be done so but i as i said i i'd, I'd like to i come from the manufacturing sector so that's, that's the sector that unido is uh, focusing on so i want to say a few things about the global value chains and and, and that's also the link that uh, the prime minister is referring to uh, local to global how do we do that and i, I think that the principle of global value chains of course that you you can make different different subsets of things in different places and then put it together with the trade liberalization. I'm, I mean, it's, it's a common uh, denominator to say global value chains, but our research from UNIDO identifies that there's more regional value chains. So there are global value chains around East Asia, around Europe and around uh, Latin America or the Americas. So it's less global than the name suggests, but it's still very common to refer to. And they, it can drive uh, upgradation of the manufacturing sector, but our work that uh, was focused, focused very much on, the, on Asia uh, basically said that what drives integration into uh, global value chains. So of, of course, trade liberalization helps. So you need to move products in and out of countries. So if that's easier, that helps, of course. Big, big geography matters. So uh, the companies that are integrating global value chains also look at the opportunities to sell in the local market. So that is a part. So you can be global value chain in one part, but also selling in local market. So in that sense, India, of course, is at a, at a, at a well placed. There's a, a relatively large uh, geography, 1.3 or 13 crore uh, people. But it also said that small geography matters too, that big can be a, a block to uh, a development of global value chains and take the example of Singapore is highly involved in global value chains, but it's very small and can be agile. So we need to look at creating islands of agility uh, around industrial parks or innovation hubs. 
uh, there is also a, a sort of a perception that investment incentives should not be overestimated. So there's a lot of focus in, in invest and make, make it attractive for companies to invest. But the, the, the integration will not happen unless also the other factors are in place. So we need to have skilled labor, access to uh, warehousing, access to research and innovation to really benefit and integrate in global value chains. And um, that then also points to that basing, uh, basically saying that building manufacturing competence comes in first. So if you, only when you're a competent manufacturing firm, you can be considered for or, or manufacturing country to be integrated in global value chains. And then, of course, the integration requires investment and that is closely linked to financing. Of course, the manufacturing compet competence is, is something that uh, Unido is very much focusing on. Then the question is often that we say we want to participate in global value chains because then we can upgrade our industries and we can innovate and so on and our findings are basically that yes uh, upgradation might happen so glo global uh, global value chain participation has a positive effect on structural transformation so getting industries that are doing higher tech industries which larger um, uh, with the largest benefits in the high tech global value chain so in the lower uh, global value chains there is less uh, uh, opportunity for upgrading. Uh, there is also then uh, that that uh, the focus on this global value chains can be one on a kind of backward uh, integration. So that is kind of the outsourced uh, assembly activities, and that don't help much in terms of uh, uh, upgrading of industries. There is the forward integration or the high road, as is some sometimes referred to, which is is looking at innovative products, innovative uh, designs, and so on. And that is where the value can come. And we can also say that what was observed by the studies is that basically the uh, uh, up, uh, success for upgrading is a little bit eroded by in those sectors where there's a high pace of change. So take electronics and so on. there's a new gadget every two days. So it's very difficult to benefit from the global value chains in the, those sectors. But on the other hand, as I said in the uh, first point, if you happen to do that, then the, the turn off the return on investment, the return is quite high. So what is also important is that, that, of course, that if you want to participate in global value change, you must also be prepared to do it in a just and an environmental sound way, so that the international buyers are looking for sustainability standards. And of course, there's now a little bit of a debate on how much of the sustainability standards will, will hold in the, in the crisis area. But by and large, if you want to be in the longer run in the global value chain, you have to show that you can meet uh, worker standards, that you can show that you're uh, uh, respect intellectual property, that you are also energy efficient, that you uh, uh, have a decent work conditions. And that is then uh, highlighted basically the work that is going on with the, the voluntary sustainability standards. So that's the standards that, uh, uh, that, that deliver and the uh, lasting benefit to a sustainable development like the, the leather standards, the uh, uh, zero discharge of hazardous chemicals uh, these standards and the uh, fair wear, fair trade uh, labels that are there. So if you want to, to move towards uh, being uh, expanding exposure to global value chains, and you can't just look at what, what's the Standards I have to meet domestically, but also what is the world expecting? And Unido is doing some uh, some work on that. I, I won't go in much detail there. So then we come to kind of manufacturing MSMEs and uh, or manufacturing SMEs. I would say more. Uh, I, I, what I'm telling is maybe less applicable to the tiny enterprise, but more to the manufacturing MSMEs. And I think that without COVID. We already saw that the small industries typically underperform in terms of productivity, innovation, occupational health and safety, energy and environment. And with our work with the uh, DC MSME, we found out that, they, that they, it, 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 there's an issue on getting information, reliable information on what is the standards, what's the technologies, what's the market's expectations. There is uh, also an issue of ill support or poor support on the innovation capacity. There is not like this uh, innovation ecosystem which exists in Japan or Australia, where I was also working that, that uh, small businesses are working together with uh, training institutes and with research institutes to solve problems. And then there's also the third point, which is highlighted below, is that small industries have kind of weak manufacturing uh, process and capability. And this is linked to the fact that many manufacturing businesses have started as traders and not necessarily as manufacturers to organize a manufacturing process. 
And of course, there is a, a, a concern that small industries and many of the older clusters are operating in clusters that are uh, basically quite polluted. And that's not an incentive to take up global manufacturing standards or global uh, expectations. Of course, we have to say that we are now living in a world of with COVID. And I just take the point also then that I don't think there is any time soon a post-COVID scenario. There will be post-lockdown, but uh, COVID will be with us. And we have seen that, uh, of course, there has been there's a, an, the element of uncertainty being added, uncertainty on what is going to happen with the disease, uncertainty how goods and people can move. That has led to uh, decline demand, or basically disruption uh, demand evaporating overnight. There's been changes in the manpower. There is uh, stocks that have been staken in, in companies that have become uh, idle and decayed. And then, we, of course, we have the supply chains disrupted. But overall, we think that if we want uh, manufacturing MSMEs to, to be more involved in global value chains and contribute to this dream of uh, manufacturing in India, we need to focus on this technology and innovation and on uh, manufacturing capabilities, which are closely intertwined. So I wanted to mention them uh, quickly, uh, this initiative which we launched with uh, India SME Forum, the UN India Business Forum and the Empretec on uh, building back uh, a business from crisis. And you see here on the top, that is a kind of a roadmap which we outlined that business should, should plan what they want to recover and they should invest to make the workplace safe and to make the workplace also uh, COVID compliant. Then to restart, which is the business of, uh, units which still make sense, then revive and revitalize growth and the future proof. And then we can link that with elements of business excellence. So I come back then back to the, the notion of innovation. So we say we revitalize businesses and then we say, look at business competencies. So in a, in a situation where cash is, uh, is very tight, we say to businesses, look how you can do better what you're already good at or do what you're good at in a different way. And then we highlight that you can do that in a kind of business products and technology. So if you talk about products, we would say, uh, uh, sorry, it should be on the other side, product uh, in terms of doing better, it would be looking at the aesthetics, the design, the our functionality, the quality and the reliability, which is the kind of the traditional issues of incremental improvement. But we say there's also the opportunities for innovation. And there I, I like the, uh, the sort of concept of uh, we have all learned uh, mathematics at school and we can do the same with products if we look at it. We can add a component. And the best example is, of course, the, the, the smartphone, which we have in our pocket, where the phone was added, our camera was added to the phone and became a hugely successful product. But it can be done in many areas. And if I just take an example of some of the Unido work, there was a floating screen that can pl catch plastics from a river. And that was combined with a, a navigation system to make it a manless system and have now this waste shark, which is a highly innovative product. We can do the subtraction, which is uh, perhaps taking a component out of a product Product and they get a new product. Classical example is to make a high chair, which it doesn't have legs, but is connected to the table. And you could say that uh, uh, maybe in other areas, we can also see those examples where you have a water heater that doesn't have a heating source, but just borrows heat from from an air conditioning unit or other waste heat. So this is kind of simple innovations if we talk about product designs or if we uh, then take uh, the division, uh, we, you would divide the product in components and then make it uh, uh, more applicable. So instead of having a sturdy bucket to put your paint, you can put it in a, in a square box so you can put more on the same pallet to transport and you do in the box a small plastic bag and you have a bag in box system, for example. Or the multiplication is the typical example that you put the same component several times in there. That's the example of the, uh, the double blade or five blade shave or the first blade cut it and pulls it out and second blade cuts it even further. So you can also do that in, in, in the product design. So have multi-stage uh, technologies and so on. So I think that we, we often talk about technology and, as, and innovation as being highly complex, but with some, some of these simple rules where you can look at products and help companies to, to conceptualize new products, and some might be ridiculous or not worth developing, and others are worth developing. So then uh, I, I also mentioned this manufacturing uh, 
excellence. And then we, we say that, yeah, if you take manufacturing excellence, we, we should make it data driven for higher productivity, lower defaults, reduced use of water, material, and energy, and reduced generation of waste and effluents and emissions. So we basically have well established practices for that. That's a lean manufacturing, industrial automation, and resource efficiency. And there's a lot of maybe not immediately patentable solutions or innovations that can be done, but there's a lot of applications of intellectual property or intellectual insight that can help manufacturing businesses ahead. So uh, then uh, let me also say something about uh, sources of innovation. And I, I used to work in a university and the research sector. So it's quite interesting to see where are the ideas coming from. And I think there is three, basically, learning is to kind of try to do a better efficiency and effectiveness basically driven by observation and that could be by data and then we can adapt so we can try to include functions or solutions that are being proven elsewhere or we can try to redefine redefine so an alternative way to find a, a, a need so more functional innovation so let me just give a few examples to see how this works so this is uh, one of the partners that we work with rhino machines they make uh, uh, sense uh, molding machines for the foundry sector and the foundry sector is very important as parts produced for cars for tractors for bicycles for basically everything and with just observing and learning from the old plan they were able to save 50 percent energy and 70 so sorry 70 uh, say 50 percent energy savings in the production and 70 percent energy savings in the dust collection so with just learning and observation and seeing where the the errors and leaks are happening you can improve a lot and get a new innovative plan then the example of trying something uh, from a, a different sector in a new sector, a good example is this waterless textile dyeing. So supercritical carbon dioxide is highly used in the, in the chemical sectors and to make also caffeine-free coffee, but you can use the same process to basically do the textile dyeing. And then you have a uh, the, you have a completely different textile industry that uses zero water, has zero waste water, has zero process chemicals, has increased the dye uptake from, from uh, 85 to 90 percent to 98 percent, which means much less loss and has vibrant colors. So that's this, this is now being applied. There is about 15 plants globally, basically in the sportswear sector. But this is new technologies that came out of taking an example, something that works in the chemical industry to the textile industry. And then the, the last example is basically redefining, and that's more about process uh, uh, application. So here we see uh, 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 making uh, the uh, uh, production of antibiotics is traditionally done with solvents, which generate a lot of, uh, of waste and, and highly highly expensive and then Cellzyme Biotech basically all uh, developed a system with biocatalysts so you don't, don't use any solvents you do it at room temperature so you have much less energy and so on so I'm talking here about examples that are innovative not necessarily selling you more product but that give you then an example of, of, uh, of being more productive and be basically doing getting more out of your manufacturing inputs and that's also business value. Um, I think now, so, so I want to then also say that there's a lot of emphasis to, to try to get from an innovator to an entrepreneur. And this is really where the intellectual property and the previous speaker was also saying. And we basically see that we, we have an innovation and ID goes to prototype and then we need to trans, transition somewhere from a prototype to start it, a business and then ultimately a, a, an enterprise, which could be a, an SME or it could be a, an arm or a business unit of a larger firm. We see a, a lot of emphasis with the initial innovators to on product value to make the product basically more valuable to the final consumer, but that doesn't necessarily add value to the investor, the business value. And we need to find uh, uh, balances in there that at some stage you have to say the product is good enough. We don't have to give perfection. There is a, a good market as we, if we match the, uh, the expectations. And there we get also issues of what was referred to partnering so that you can scale up to manufacturing and scale up to, to market and distribution. And that is the, 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 the trick with a lot of innovation is that it stops somewhere at a prototype because the innovators cannot grow to entrepreneurs and that is a really a, a challenge so that's why I've, some of the unita programs have worked on uh, so to uh, when we say this uh, challenge program which is a low carbon technology program and gcif is this 
an accelerator program. So this GSIP Global Clean, Te Clean Tech Innovation Program worked for uh, four years in India. We supported 86 companies, I think, and 26 became startup companies. And you see some examples. This is uh, an, a, a commercial burning a burner or cooking unit, which is 30% more energy efficient. This is a waste heat recovery unit. This is a fan, which has much lower energy use. This is a, a sanitary pads made from waste banana fiber. And this is a, a company that extracts basically the soot out of uh, uh, polluted air. And they, this program invested $1 million and generated and 7 million investments in, um, uh, in, in these companies. And this was an est estimate uh, about two years ago in the 18 months after that had tripled to 21 million. So there's a lot of potential with indigenous Indian innovations to go and as help them to go to market, to me mentor them to go to market. And that's maybe some work that you need or ISF and DCM SME could work on. I don't also wanted to mention this kind of challenge program, which we run on specific innovation challenges. And in this case, on waste heat recovery, on space conditioning, and on pumping systems. And we did this in, and we, we, uh, uh, we basically asked companies to come forward and innovators with new ideas. And then we helped them to deploy this in industry under this program. In 2018 was the first uh, time we, we did this. And that was the, then uh, we had 13 winners and we spent uh, 500,000 uh, uh, US on supporting innovations and pilot sites in, in fight and monitoring, reporting and verification done. So I just want to, to give a blurb that on Friday, there's actually a workshop on demonstrating some of these innovative technologies. I think because of the screen, something popping up. Then 2019, there was a similar group of winners. And I just want to highlight that the challenge on this low carbon innovations is still, still open until the 31st of March, 2020. So maybe in closing, I think that we are talking about global, global, going from local to global, so global value change. But this can only work if we really invest in manufacturing excellence. And this manufacturing excellence in MSME segment, segment will then drive productivity and diversification of products. And diversification will mean also added value will give you a better a better brand proposition a better value proposition to get a good price but it needs to uh, embrace also sustainability and inclusiveness and these improvements come then from innovating but innovating is not so, just something you do in the lab innovating is also about how you run the business how you operate processes how you deploy technologies and how you design products so with that, I would like to uh, conclude. Thank you very much for giving an opportunity to Unido. And, and indeed, we are very much open for, open for business, I want to say, to try to assist uh, MSMEs to innovate and to drive the agenda of productivity, export-driven growth in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Burkel. That was uh, very, very insightful. Uh, may I now uh, take the pleasure of inviting Ms. Uh, Tamara Nanayakara, Counselor at the SMEs and Entrepreneurship Support Division, Department for Transition and Developed Countries of the World Intellectual Property Organization, which we know as WIPO. She joined WIPO in January 1994 and worked in the cooperation for Development Bureau for Asia and the Pacific Economic Analysis Forecast and Research Division, and the Least Developed Countries Division. Over to you, Ms. Tamara. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for, uh, to you for having invited me uh, to this very interesting conference. Um, does, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And, um, and so it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I will just uh, share my screen. Um, um, Do you see it now? Do you see my screen now? Yes, we can see yes. it. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna speak about uh, intellectual property issues in global value chains. And I'm glad I'm coming after Mr. Van Berkel who uh, is uh, very clearly an expert on these areas. And um, so I want, uh, it's a good uh, segue to, to my presentation. 
So uh, as he explained, uh, it's the distribution of production processes of a final product to different actors in different geographical locations. And like he explained, it is more, more regional as opposed to global. Um, but uh, so this means that um, countries no longer uh, need to be able to produce a whole product, but they can participate in global value chains by specializing in producing one part uh, of a product. And this can be part of a very complex network of suppliers that come together to produce that final product. So by specializing in producing that one product, uh, countries and especially developing countries have been able to join uh, this international network of suppliers uh, and agents of, uh, of the global value chain. So this has been a very useful uh, development uh, uh, for many countries in the, in the third world. And uh, so let me just uh, introduce you to intellectual property. Um, so uh, any new product ideas, new ways of doing things, attractive designs, creative and artistic efforts, business identifiers can all be uh, protected by what is called intellectual property, which is essentially a, a legal creation. Uh, if not for the fact that a law creates uh, these rights, it would not exist. So in other words, it's, it's, it's uh, artificial creation. And these rights are broadly uh, what we call patent rights, trademarks, designs, copyright, and trade secrets, which respectively uh, protect uh, inventions, business signs, design rights, uh, creative and artistic products, and confidential business information. And the, the first three, the patent rights, trademarks, and design rights, have to require an active uh, uh, action from an applicant to go and seek IP rights. You have to go and follow a process that is, that is indicated by law, and you have to um, acquire these rights by following this, this, this process that is set down by law. Whereas for copyright, it is usually available uh, at the point of creation. And trade secrets by virtue of being uh, secrets uh, don't require any procedure. So these are broadly the different IP rights that are available uh, to a business and they can and should be collectively used uh, with respect to a product in order to pursue a particular uh, business strategy. So having understood what global value chains are and having understood what intellectual property is, how do these things come together? And what is the relevance of intellectual property to global value chains? And if you look at this um, so-called uh, SMILE uh, uh, graph that economists uh, use to, to plot where the, the, the revenue uh, or the value is in value chains. And you can see that the value is is mostly in the in the in one end where there is R and D and design, and at the other end where there is branding and after sales services. And it is at the lowest point in the in the at the point of manufacturing. So the revenue gains are really in the R and D and branding and design areas, which means that that it is those who are actually owners of intellectual property who are getting the biggest benefits. Out of, the, out, out of this whole uh, global value chain. So this is where, uh, this is what is important to remember that the global value chains, the, the biggest winners are those who are intellectual property rights holders. And I want to just identify two uh, important qualities of intellectual property, which is important to understanding uh, the impact of intellectual property. And one is that intellectual property rights are intangible. And this creates two, uh, this creates a, a dis disadvantage and an advantage. The disadvantage is that you're not able to exclude others like, like you can with tangible property. If I, if I have this pen, I, I, I hold this pen, but if I give it to somebody else, I don't know, I no longer have it and that somebody else has, has it and only that somebody else has it. Whereas the, the flip side or the advantage is that with intellectual property rights, because it's intangible, you can give it to as many people uh, as you wish. And as many people uh, are able to exploit it and use it. Like, like there are, as you said, 800 plus people who are listening to this conference. Uh, what I'm saying is can be acquired and used by that 800 and more. So that is the benefit and the, and the, and the great thing about intangible rights. And the other thing is intellectual property rights are territorial. 
which means, as I said, it's an artificial system created by law and it's only valid in the country or region where it was granted. So, which means you have to apply for and obtain in the case of patents, trademarks and designs in the countries or regions of interest. So if you look at how IP rights are in intersecting with global value chains, we have to see what exactly happens in these value chains. And, and one of the most important things to keep in mind is that if you are working across borders, you have to transfer knowledge, information, innovations to your partners who are working with you across these borders. So there's a transfer of knowledge. Then your, your, the production of these goods are, are being marketed uh, they are marketed in the, on the backs of the of brands, uh, so that they are, there's a reputation of brands that are involved. Then, in particular, in agri supply chains, there are there is the opportunity uh, for differentiated products like bio products and niche products, etc. And also, I think as uh, as uh, uh, Sri Suresh Prabhu mentioned at the beginning, that if you are in uh, supply chains that that at the at, at the end where you actually producing R&D, you're pro pro providing technical solutions, you're creating designs, then you are, you are, you are also, while participating in these uh, value chains, you're also producing innovative output and, and creations. So these are the areas that you will have IP intersecting uh, within global value chains. So if you take the first one, when you're transferring uh, across borders, registrable IP, which I, by which I mean patents, trademarks, designs, you're transferring them to um, for others to use across these these uh, these chains. Then you have to remember, as I said earlier, remember that IP rights are territorial, which means you have to protect them in those countries in order for those people to use them. Uh, in order for you to protect your own rights, you have to protect in those countries, which which creates certain complications. One is that, as I said, IP laws are national. So which means different national laws would be different. And there might be different requirements in those national laws, which has to be kept in mind, which, which add, adds a complexity. Then there are deadlines. You, have, you can't just register IP rights. You have to do so within a certain deadline. Where, I, where patent rights are concerned, you have to apply for your IP rights in that uh, second country within one year of having applied uh, in your uh, home country. And then even if you have uh, registered IP rights in those countries, it, did, it does not necessarily mean that you can actually use them. It depends on what is called freedom to operate. You need to have the freedom to operate. You need to be sure that there's nobody in that market who has something protected which can conflict with your IP rights or prevent you from using your IP rights. So these are things you need to know if you're working in a global value chain where you have to protect your IP rights in those, in those countries. And once you are protected, like I explained to you, since they are intangible, you can give different users the right to use them. This is called licensing. You can provide others the right to use. And this right can be used, can be given to multiple users. So you can have multiple uh, licenses. Then you have the, the cross-border transfer of unregisterable IP. Here we're talking about mainly about confidential business information, which has also been transferred across borders. And here, the biggest concern is that of leakage. Uh, people might steal your confidential information or they might inadvertently uh, uh, be, be leaked to other people. So therefore, uh, this information is usually transferred in the context of um, non-disclosure agreements. And these non-disclosure non agreements uh, would be need to be put in place. And you have to put in place measures in your companies to protect the confidential information that you receive. Uh, from whoever it is that you're working with. So this is another important factor where IP intersects uh, in the global value chain. As I said earlier that you are, the products that have been manufactured are, manu are, are finally being marketed uh, in the context of a brand. And one of the important things to keep in mind is that when consumers buy products, they have a, a, a trademarks the, the most, uh, well, uh, the initial point to make is that trademarks are a tool for differentiating your products from those of other companies. And at the same time, the consumer expects or has a certain expectation of the source of the product, the where this product is coming from. 
and if you if you outsource the production of your of your product you're no longer maintaining that that promise as it were uh, to the consumer and so in order to honor that promise there will be stringent quality control measures that are imposed by a trademark owner on a manufacturer that you have to have to follow because otherwise the reputation of the brand owner could be affected if the uh, quality of the products are not good i mean for example if uh, if if you're buying a mercedes uh, you have a certain expectation that this is a german car with with a german quality and 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 that's the kind of expectation you have of that car but but the mercedes may be may be manufactured elsewhere and uh, the components are certainly manufactured elsewhere the car itself may be assembled elsewhere and not in germany but but mercedes maintains that promise to the consumer by ensuring that certain quality standards are maintained and as i said there are opportunities in niche markets where in agri business supply chains for example trademarks this particularly collective marks certificate uh, certificate marks and geographical indications uh, can be effectively used to capture markets through niche products because increasingly consumers are looking for more than uh, than just um, a, a brand in a, in a, in 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 the sense they're looking for understanding where this brand comes from uh, are the are the farmers well paid are the conditions good and all that could be captured in something like a certificate mark or a geographical indication so this is an opportunity that could be there for for developing countries to enter uh, supply chains in the agribis uh, by using collective marks and certification marks and then those participants in um, in global value chains who are collaborating uh, or or contracted to find technical solutions to create designs to develop a certain creative content etc they are they are in fact creating uh, new knowledge new information which could be protected by intellectual property rights and so it's very important in those contexts for those participants to know or, or agree in advance who would own uh, that um, the intellectual property to that output because this will have implications so if the person to whom you're providing for example contract research uh, determines that all results of that research will be owned by them then you will have no rights uh, to that to that intellectual property so it's important to decide these things in advance and know that if you have uh, contributed to developing certain technical solutions or creating certain designs etc that you have um, certain rights uh, that you have negotiated in advance for them so uh, in conclusion given the complexity and the extensive geographical reach of uh, global value chains it is it is extremely important to keep in mind uh, the impact of intellectual property uh, rights on on the whole uh, on the various interactions that you have uh, in the global value chain and this is going back to that smile curve to be to try to position yourself where you can extract more value from the value chain which is by being an intellectual property rights holder as well as from a risk management perspective in not falling into trouble by not having thought about uh, the intellectual property issues that are relevant uh, in uh, in a global value chain so uh, on that i will i will stop uh, this presentation and uh, i'll be happy to take questions later on thank you thank you very much ms tamara uh, thank you for that presentation I would like to invite uh, Ms. Hanna Ondrakova, our next esteemed speaker. Uh, she is Head Intellectual Property at European Business and Technology Center. She has 10 years of cross-functional experience in the field of IPR and has worked as a patent attorney and as a researcher for one of the biggest KPO in India. At EPTC, her role involves coordinating activities of EPO to enhance IP awareness of the Indian industry as well as to foster cooperation with the relevant Indian authorities. Her topic today is IP ecosystem for doing business in India. So welcome, Hannah. Uh, before you start, just a small uh, announcement uh, we have. 
is um, for our uh, participants and attendees who are watching us on Facebook and who are part of this uh, webinar group. Uh, we will be issuing a certificate of attendance for today's uh, conference at the end uh, uh, of this uh, program. And uh, 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 all those uh, who wish to claim it can write to us at dg at indiasmeforum.com. And the questions uh, and answers for all of our esteemed speakers will be taken at a time when all of our esteemed speakers have completed uh, their presentations. So um, thanks uh, for that. And uh, over to you, uh, Ms. Hannah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for um, inviting me. I just shared my screen, if you can see it. Yeah, can you see? So uh, when I was asked to um, very kindly to present this, uh, this uh, presentation, I uh, thought that I conceptualized it a little bit uh, from the bottom level, what has been happening in the IPR ecosystem in India. And of course, in connection to what EBTC as an organi organization does in terms of the, of the Indian and European collaboration. So before we proceed any further, I would like just to quickly uh, summarize the developments which have been happening in recent years at Indian, uh, in the Indian IT ecosystem. The major change in India came, as you probably many of you know, in 2016 when uh, um, Union Cabinet has issued national IPR policy. The national IPR policy basically impacted uh, the Throughout the, uh, throughout the IPR system. It had the objective of increasing IPR awareness, uh, increase the commercialization of Indian innovation, um, generation of IP, investing in human resources, et cetera. As a part of the IPR policy, there were also major changes at Indian Patent Office. India Patent Office hired large numbers of examiners. They speeded up their processes, the grant rates uh, increased the processing of patent applications went from years to let's say three, four, five, seven years to actually two years. So over the years of since 2016, these changes have been really, really evident. And whoever has worked in Indian IPR over the years, they, they would probably agree with me. On the side of that, India always had and still has, since it was discussed earlier by, by different speaker, the problem of enforcement. So in 2016, uh, commercial codes were enacted, uh, which were supposed to handle the IPR infringement and IPR related matter. It has been, I would say, so to say, successfully implemented, although due, due to the backlog and other issues, it's still not, uh, we would say, perfect. India has been trying to move towards this direction of innovation economy, we can say. And in order to do that, you need to have a very strong startup uh, support. There have been really amazing um, initiative um, organized by the Indian government, be it from the Ministry of Economics and Telecommunication, MITI. I mean, they have a huge um, uh, startup ecosystem for ICT related startups. There are a lot of um, startups or accelerators like GAINS and so on. So these days, the IP ecosystem or the, the startup ecosystem in India is uh, pretty active, and there is a lot of funds for the, for the SMEs to from the, sorry, for the startups to take from and learn. Of course, there are different issues in terms of scaling up and providing proof of concept, et cetera, and cooperation with the industry. And the last, at least, when we spoke about the Indian Patent Office in 2016 as well, there was uh, amendments in the Indian Patent Act. And these amendments, of course, uh, had, of course, impact on, uh, on the speed speed of the of the proceedings proceedings since they shortened the response to examination report for one year to six months and also to different uh, statutory requirements like uh, which is very actually uh, suitable for the foreigner applicants let's say deleting claims when you are uh, entering national phase in india without having to pay for them so there was the major chance and of course there were some other issues i don't really want to go too much into technicality so we see that over the past few years, the, the changes have been pretty impressive. Having said that, there is still space, there is still space for improvement. So 
So in the empathy system still suffers through the lack of enforcement, the problems with the counterfeit, counterfeiting and piracy, and, and in terms of patentability matters, section 3K and 3D and so on. So there are still issues which the European or the foreigner companies experience where they want to patent the innovation in India. And of course, the very similar issue in terms of patentability would apply to Indian applicants as well. So where does EBTC stand in all that? EBTC has uh, been um, in, a, you can say, uh, this collaborative space between India and Europe for a number of years. We were established in 2008 as a part of European project. And one of the initiatives we have is what we call Europe India IP Forum. And the Europe India IP Forum is basically, you can imagine it, as I call it, platform or body of knowledge, which helps to address IP related issues and challenges and market access problems of the companies through various interactions. It can be stakeholder meetings, it can be conferences, seminars, research papers, you name it. So any problem which the particular stakeholder has, it can be both European or Indian. We meet up with the relevant parties and we discuss it and we try to come to some sort of conclusion. We have a three pillars. Uh, the first one is the pillar of IP awareness. Of course, a lot has been done over the years in India. I mean, there is uh, these days every industry association, you can look uh, FICI, NASCOM, ASOCHAM, whoever has IPR training. Uh, but we still believe that there should be um, you know, awareness about the individual patent systems. So awareness uh, about the Indian patent system to European stakeholders or to European companies, and then uh, sharing the expertise and what is the IPR, how to comply with foreign standards to the, to the Indian, um, Indian SMEs or Indian startups. The next pillar would be IP man management and support. This is to support companies for in regards to market entry, again, access to awareness, uh, where to file, how to file in India and so on. So this would be again, this program, which kind of caters to uh, mostly to the European companies entering, entering Indian market. And the third one is of course, commercialization. Um, I think, Generally, unfortunately, in India and particularly in the SME sector, from my personal experience, the idea is that patent is a good to have thing, but it's still a little bit piece of paper which costs you a lot of money. And I think this is the major mindset which smaller Indian companies have to change. And see patent, as was said by many other people, something which can bring you revenue, something where you invest, something which actually can innovate and bring this innovation. It doesn't have to be out of the country. Also within India, you can find collaboration partners. So the third pillar, it's not only obviously for the foreigner companies to find uh, collaborative partners in India, but also for Indian companies, uh, Indian SMEs to find collaboration partners or licensing partners in Europe. So overall, if I, if, I, if I kind of summarize it, we are working with a number of different organizations, be it industry organizations, as I said, FICI, ASOCHAM, NASCOM, um, to startup ecosystem like MH, uh, the mighty MHS Hub. Um, we work with few German startup ecosystem. Uh, we work with academia. So we work through various parties and through them, we would be reaching out to the, all these, you know, stakeholders, all these SMEs and startups uh, and really teach them and, you know, about the knowledge sharing, the support of the commercialization and assist their internalization. So it was, it was just very, very briefly about, about the IP forum. And as I said, uh, EBTC, as an organization has been in, the, in this space since 2008, and we transited into this uh, non-for-profit organization, which is really focused on project facilitation and advising company, and really try to enhance the economic activity and collaboration between India and Europe. Some of the other initiatives which we have, I would like to also mention that EBTC is very uh, focused on the sustainability. So we work in the ICT space, we work within those uh, different sustainable technologies and supporting uh, the sustainable technologies as we will talk later when it comes to European projects, which we are also supporting. As said earlier, we are uh, collab 
we are implementation partner of European Patent Office. Some of our um, colleagues have spoken already. And the aim which we are trying to, uh, of course, um, implement here in India is again to enhance the capacity of, of, of Indian industry, you know, to teach them, to bring the awareness, to teach them about the, the best practices, international standards, drafting of patent applications and so on. So this is a very important aspect where we want to build the, the, the Indian innovation and the Indian you know, innovation ecosystem, you can say. Um, I already spoke about the IP forum. We are um, we work with a lot of cluster approach. So of course the companies, Indian SMEs, some like yourself who are already quite mature and they believe they can contribute towards this type of um, engagements. They can definitely get in touch with us and we can always evaluate whether you can be part of our clusters and whether we can kind of find collaboration with the European partners. So what I would like to majorly mention is the actual collaboration between India and Europe. So one of these uh, very ongoing projects right now is what we call business support to the EU-India uh, policy dialogues. So at the moment, there are a number of dialogues happening between India and Europe, particularly in the areas of cooperation, such as environment, energy and climate, ICT, and so on. So these are the number of policy dialogues which are going on. And on the side of the policies have been set up uh, concrete projects where we are trying to get the technology, European technology transfer, exchange of expertise, and of course, concrete business opportunities. So this is, this is something where the European technology is brought to India to address environmental issue. I think very, um, uh, famous, I would say famous, very ongoing project right now, right now is the Ganga project for the clean water system, for instance. So this is something where European companies are taking part, uh, part here and helping, you know, uh, on the environmental front in India. As uh, uh, Jan from Indian, but oh yeah, this is, I forgot. To, so this is also one of the parts of this, um, one of the initiative of the business project is the India Readiness Toolkit. Why I chose to mention this particular uh, initiative here is just to indicate that how vital for European companies IPR is. So when they are sitting in Europe and they are considering entering India, they are using this uh, India Readiness Toolkit to evaluate where they are in terms of, uh, you know, how much they know about taxation, about the visa, about how can set up their... Uh, business here and so on, but the large part of it also about the IPR, how much they know about in the IPR, how much they know what can be protected, what can be enforced and so on. So IPR is clearly very, very important for the, for the European SMEs. As I said, um, in 2017-2018, which was around 47,000 application filed in India overall. Around 24% roughly were filed by the European applicants. So it clearly indicates that there are, you know, a lot of technology coming from, from, from Europe uh, to India. And of course, uh, India, as well as the Europe, are very SME-driven economies. And of course, the European Commission is very, very aware of it, that the, that the companies need that, that particular support. And they are offering this very, I would say, um, uh, useful service to the European SMEs, which is called uh, SME IPR Help Desk. So the SME IPR Help Desk is essentially a free service for the European companies which want to enter Indian market. And they talk about, you know, registering for me IPRs, uh, what sort of IPRs are protected in India. Uh, you know, uh, how to deal with the infringement and so on. So this is a free service for the, Euro uh, for the European IPRs. As of now, they are in, in Europe, of course, in China, Latin America, Southeast Asia. And I would like to really say that from uh, second half of this should be also present in India. So this is very briefly about this Indo-European cooperation. But when we talk about you as the as the Indian SMEs, how can you benefit from the activities which we are uh, doing here? 
because of course we we want to develop it should not be just one way street type of exercise you know it should be i really truly believe i spent you know a decade in india right now so i really truly believe in, in innovation of course it will maybe still take time a little bit but we believe that uh, we can contribute towards you know indian ip ecosystem by exchange of the best practices along with our partners like indian patent office let's say to again through the seminars and workshop to strengthen the cap uh, technical capacities to you know increase the ipr awareness i don't mean just necessarily uh for some people it might be just basic ipr awareness course what the ipr is for some people it would be more about use of patent information resources for some company it'd be more up to what is the claim how the claim look like what actually is protected by your patent you know how to judge that when you draft a patent application is drafted well enough so this patent can be commercialized so this type of exercise so the indian smes they get empowered you know you will have your own in-house knowledge how this thing should look like and then because i believe you know there was a comment from you shushma ma'am that uh shushma ma'am that there is not enough ipr lawyers of course this might be case as well but i believe that you know these days there are so much resources that and there are so many of them for free that the Indian SMEs, if they really want, they would find a way how to educate themselves. And I think this should be really a kind of learning curve, I would like to say, from my presentation, not only that there is a lot of European innovation coming to India, but there are supporting mechanisms for the Indian SMEs, and they should really use it for their own benefit. Yeah, so this is <laughs> this is my my rant. Thank you very much. And of course, if you have any questions and if you want to take part in any of our programs, we'll be very be very happy to uh, very happy to accommodate that. Yeah. So yeah, thank, thank you. you very much for that, Miss Hannah. That was lovely. Uh, in fact, uh, we would uh, love to you know collaborate after this conference, and we yeah. would specifically. Uh, you know, to hold a conference between uh, India and Europe. So, so we must collaborate uh, after this conference, uh, and uh, we'll hold it maybe in the next uh, few days. Also, yeah. I'd like to mention here, uh, we run a 10,000 SME program where we identify uh, successful, sustainable uh, uh, entrepreneurs or SMEs who are very successful in their business. They are, uh, you know, we do enough uh, due diligence. Um, so we know that the, these companies are financially uh, extremely stable and they are ready for entering into any kind of joint ventures and partnerships with yeah. any company, any global company. So, so we must look at collaborating on that front. So thank yeah. you very much for your presence. You're very welcome. You're yeah, very welcome. After this thank conference. you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next esteemed uh, speaker, Mr. Uh, Gerard Owens. He is the country coordinator for international cooperation at the European Patent Office. He coordinates international relations with various countries in the Middle East, Asian, including India and Oceania regions. Gerard has been working at the EPO in Munich for over his coordinated activities in IP5, especially WG2, bilateral activities between EPO and WIPO, and public policy issues, including the interactions of the global patent system with initiatives in climate change, ICT standards, and life sciences. Welcome, Gerard. Thank you for joining today. Welcome. So thank you very, very much, Director General. Thank you also to Hannah, who are our implementation partners in India. Um, it's very, very uh, uh, pleasure. It's a great, great pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'm delighted to hear that we're able to uh, see so many people as well. We're basically, I understand that we're outreaching all together to, to about uh, 700 people, plus even 100 plus of your members as well at the same time. And um, I'll try and give you a very, very brief overview of some of the two of the case studies that we've done. Altogether, as Jan Menier showed you, our chief economist, we've done about 20 case studies in detail of small and medium-sized medium enterprises in Europe. 
and the way that they use IP to help them support their business strategy and make them successful. So without messing about too much, I would just like to present in particular the SME's case study for Picote. And Picote is a firm in Finland that deals with pipes, repairing pipes, relining pipes and things like that. And they have the wonderful motto, pipe repairs that break the rules, but don't break the walls. And I presume they're talking about the pipes themselves in that respect. Um, so they're a small Finnish company started in 1993. They these days have offices also in the UK and the USA. And they started off providing very, very specialist services for relining the inside of pipes. So instead of having to dig a wall open or the ground open and be able to, from the outside, repair a pipe, they actually are able to go inside the pipes and um, they're able to repair the pipes, regrind the pipes, also reline the pipes and stop them leaking from the inside. Now, typically this is done with being done on bigger pipes with robotics and so on. They're able to do it without robotics, which is much cheaper. And they're also allowed, able to do it with, with much smaller pipes at the same time. So they started off providing very, very specialist contracting facilities in repairing pipes and what they call drain rehabilitation. Um, what they've done is they found that they didn't have the tools that were available uh, to, they didn't have the tools that were really designed for the job that they needed. And therefore they started to develop their own tools. And as a result of that, they started to patent them and they've developed into a semi-global business now, still an SME, but with their main markets in Finland, Europe as a whole, but also the USA. So firstly, they'll show you, uh, we can show you here some of the tools that they've used uh, and started off with. Things to clean the inside of pipes, um, get into pipes and really regrind them and give you a, a nice clean surface inside. Different ways of unblocking pipes as well. Um, and they've developed this product market on and on. They have basically about 30 different types of tools now because they have types for a basic number of operations, but they have different types of tools which are um, optimized for different sizes of pipes as well, different lengths of pipes, different types of pipes and all that kind of thing. So they're cleaning pipes, cutting them, lining them, uh, refurbishing them and monitoring whether the pipes are still providing the service that they should do. So they started off then basically uh, in 1993 with just the contracting services. Since 2008, they've started to build their own tools and they've then had to basically use IP to help uh, the, support the R&D that was necessary to design their own tools, manufacture the tools, and also then sell the tools as well as their contracting services to the industry around. And therefore it's a dual model of the contracting services also those services being licensed out, but also um, reinforced by the product development and sales that they do at the same time. According to their CEO, Mr. Mika Lokinen, it was a good decision to start patenting in 2008. It's a very serious decision because it costs money and they have to have professionals to do it as well. They have to pay a lot of money to maintain their patents, to file them, Etc. Etc. Nevertheless, it allows them to invest money in R and D. That's given them that's given them a lot of market entry with solutions which are better and faster and cheaper than the robotic alternatives that were available on the market. They now have many very highly competing solutions, and the trouble is that those solutions are very clear on the outside. They're very visible to other people, and therefore. The um, trade secrets way of protecting your intellectual property is not adequate because people can so clearly see where the advantages are and they can start to produce them and copy them themselves. Therefore, to maintain the premium price that they have to maintain, to repay their research and development, um, they have to have patent protection. And in the end, that makes them then less expensive than competing products that aren't allowed to use their inventions. So their IP strategy, to summarize, 
It evolves to support their new business case. From 1993 to 2008, they had no IP strategy or patent filings. From 2008 to 2012, they kind of had an ad hoc strategy. They developed new products and then they patented some of these inventions as they developed the new inventions. But from 2012 onwards, they've had a proper IP management, which takes a much more strategic look and backs up their business strategy at the same time. So they now, for the IP management, they have hired an IP expert who is inside the company, works very closely with the R&D people, the marketing people, the development people, and um, also the people producing their tools in the first place. And that gives them an expert who's able to, inside the company, look after the, the, the company's interests effectively to streamline the patenting processes and control the costs in a way that supports the business better. This person also does database searching to find out what the prior art is that already exists, to ensure that they have freedom to operate in the markets where they want to operate, to watch their competitors and see what their competitors are doing and how they develop, and to produce patent landscaping reports to see where they could best fill new gaps with the research and development that they might want to do. And they're therefore building up a portfolio which protects their inventions, protects their market, and also prevents copying, uh, but supports their license process as well. So creating value in a business through the patenting itself, the patenting can support and help motivate the, the transition to this new business model. So from going from contracting services to building tools, selling those tools, and now combining both the old and the new business models in a supportive transition phase. They have to patent their new inventions if people are not to copy their inventions and the patenting safeguards their investment in the research and development. In terms of the IP strategy, the takeaway messages are that if you're this kind of company, it's better to have an in-house IP expert who will then ensure that your processes are efficient and strategic and they match the strategy of the company itself. The in-house uh, IP expert can enforce the patents, firstly in a friendly way by insisting on licensing. And if people don't license, then they might go to infringement in courts. Their distributors and the customers can help with their policy because they tell them what their requirements are. And the patent landscaping, again, supports their R&D strategy. So really their IP strategy is completely integrated in their business strategy, helps guide their business strategy in a way, but the two work very, very closely together. And that's their advantage in having an internal IP expert. So that's to sum up for Picote, the, the, the situation that they're in and the way that they've developed since 2008 in, with their patenting business. And very, very quickly, I'd like to show you the second of these 20 SME companies, um, which I also think is very, very important and is a good example for European-Indian collaboration, for instance. So Orkin Energy develops these micro power plants, which attach to a large coal or oil power plant. And what they do is these unitary mini power plants that you see here, you have one, two, three, four, five units here, that are attached to an existing larger power plant. And they are micro power plants that take the very hot exhaust gases out of uh, a energy producing plant, like a coal plant uh, or oil fired plant. And they convert these very hot gases into further energy, which creates further electricity. So they are power plants in their own right, run on the hot gases, the exhaust gases that come out of the existing power plants. And that was novel technology. They have used in particular, sorry, I'll need to get some, rid of some of these panels. They have in particular, um, they use low boiling point solvents, which are very, very efficient at getting the heat out at a lower temperature whereas water would be much less efficient. Um, and they've produced the mini power plants around this to create further electricity. So you have increased electricity production, 
We have reduced CO2 emissions because many of the CO2 emissions are taking out and generally a much higher improved energy efficiency for the whole power plant. So they've gone from a government-based, government-supported um, startup where they came out of a university. It came from research and development from the university. It's a startup originating in the university with young people um, in a way that we would love to see the same sort of thing happen in China, in India in particular as well. They're creating jobs themselves. Over the time, they've created really with cutting edge technology, 23 pattern families altogether. Eight of these are from the Technisch Technical University in Munich, and that's where they originated. And they have had a very, very fast and early transfer of um, governance of the company from the university itself and from the university patents to Orkin itself. And that transition of the IP portfolio was very important for investors so they could get extra capital into the company and they could really expand very fast using the capital that was available. They've explored outsourcing and outlicensing and therefore application into other markets. And in particular, as they wanted to expand from Europe into Asia and Africa, they needed to find a partner that was competent in those regions. And they've coupled up with a, a Chinese company. Um, they already got more than 80 orders in the first month, which is incredible, having got their Chinese partner. And that's helped them expand very, very rapidly. They now have this big joint venture, which is totally dependent on IP, because otherwise their products and processes could be copied um, without any kind of uh, licensing or payment to them. It's been very, very successful, but the patent ownership at all times is retained by Orkin Energy to make sure the power stays with them. So thank you very, very much for that. This is two, these are only two out of the 20 examples that we've documented very thoroughly in this um, European SME IP strategy and management study. The documents are available on our website or also um, IP Forum, you have these, sorry, the, the Indian SME Forum, you have this document as well, and you can distribute it free of charge afterwards. So thank you very, very much for the opportunity to present this to you, and I hand over back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Owens. Uh, that was uh, lovely. Of course, yes, we have the document and we will be publishing and we will also distribute it amongst our members and with your contacts. So of course, uh, uh, any uh, information uh, sought uh, will be received by you directly. Um, thank you. I would now like to invite uh, our esteemed speaker, uh, Mr. Renaud Gaylard. He is the Regional Counselor for Intellectual Property at the Embassy of France in New Delhi, India since 2015, and is also the Regional South Asia expert for INPI. Combining a public-private experience in government and public affairs strategy for more than 20 years, he has dealt with various IP matters such as brand protection, geographical indications, promotion, and IP awareness. Over to you, Mr. Gellar. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Dr. Leo. Thank you. I'm happy to see also some friends and colleagues uh, on the internet. Uh, uh, it's a pity we can't we can't just uh, grab hands and uh, and see uh, each other physically, but it will happen someday. Uh, so first, I would try to um, share um, what I want to share with you. Can you see it? Hi. Yes. Hello. Yeah. You can see that. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. So, um, so as, as you mentioned, uh, I've been in India for five years now um, um, after um, creation of a new pool at the Embassy of France in Delhi, uh, dealing exclusively with IP. I'm part of the um, economic department of the embassy and I'm sent here by the French um, IP uh, office. Uh, but also I'm also part of the uh, Ministry of uh, Economy and Finance in France. And uh, I'm covering not only uh, India, but also uh, South Asia. 
and uh, I'm uh, here also to implement um, a cooperation program with the Indian IPO. So what I want to share with you today uh, is um, the quite, uh, let's say, um, impressive uh, IP uh, SME program that we have uh, in France. We've been implementing it for more than 10 years now and uh, quite successfully. Uh, so successfully that um, many IP offices or countries around the world with whom we, ha we have MOUs uh, would like to uh, share uh, our, our experience and expertise on how to promote um, IP awareness and uh, on a pragmatic way vis-a-vis uh, -vis the SMEs. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you exactly what we do in France and what our vision is as a, an IP office. So of course, an IP office, uh, we do the same as all those IP offices around the world also. Uh, we grant IP rights, we register all kind of IP rights, even uh, geographical indications for art and crafts. Uh, we host applicants, we draft IP laws and regulations, we propose new new uh, regulations and new uh, uh, provisions in laws. Uh, we have this strong uh, support program for SMEs. Uh, we implement international cooperation programs and MOUs uh, with IP offices around the world, and which is and also which is quite new uh, compared to other IP offices. We have an enforcement also program uh, because we represent the National anti counterfeiting Committee in France. So we are also in the middle of the uh, anti counterfeiting policy and actions uh, in France. So as an IP office, well, just mentioned that uh, WTR ranking was quite nice uh, in, uh, in, in its um, last ranking because uh, he um, uh, granted us uh, the second uh, position as most innovative IPO. Um, we tend to consider ourselves as the house of innovators, as we as we say. Um, as I knew DG uh, his position uh, bit more than a year ago uh, was uh, saying that IPO is really here to facilitate the life of companies. So we really have um, business um, background and business savvy within the IPO. Uh, we are of course completely, almost completely. Uh, Dematerialized with e-filing up to 99%. We have a startup dedicated program. Uh, we have new um, tools such as patent mapping that we can offer also to companies. Uh, we use a lot of uh, interaction online with chatbot and hotlines. Uh, many many companies are calling us every day, uh, hundreds uh, of them, and uh, we also have uh, proposed new uh, new provisions in the in the IP law that uh, that is going to change also the the the, the life of um, of our IP rights in France and giving the IPO uh, new uh, new powers. Um, so we are an agency under the authority of Ministry of Economy, Finance, and Industry. Almost uh, 800 people uh, working all together. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a very strong business background. We uh, from a procedural culture to service culture to for corporate and business. This is our move um, for the past 20 years. Uh, we have a training and coaching service program that will, I will uh, elaborate a bit uh, further. Um, we have a contract of performance and objective with the French government, of course, and we represent the, the French uh, government, you know, um, national, uh, EU and international uh, bodies uh, related to IP. Um, we have a strong national in France um, uh, network, but also I'm myself part of an international network of 10 uh, IP councillors around the world. Um, we almost, uh, among our, ourselves, cover the, the whole world uh, with our 10 uh, uh, councillors. Um, in France, uh, to develop this business um, culture, we have also uh, signed a lot of um, um, cooperation programs uh, with all the regions. You know, in France, we're not uh, uh, a country with different states uh, like in India, but we are a country with different regions. 
And uh, these regions have uh, a kind of autonomy also when it comes to uh, um, support of uh, their own economic uh, environments. So we have signed some uh, programs to, um, to develop IP um, coaching uh, programs for them uh, whenever they organize uh, any economic activity uh, on the field. And we also have uh, many innovation uh, conventions with uh, the bodies and operators all around the, the country, uh, like tech transfer organizations. Uh, you have all these French names that I'm sure you don't know, but all these names are, um, are linked with the uh, innovation programs, uh, public, but also private. And uh, we're here to support them uh, to, to try to transfer innovation to really business uh, uh, so we have we work with competitive clusters hubs of course uh, that we have in France um, and uh, and many laboratories uh, mentioned. So really our identity um, today is to provide and manage IP rights, of course, uh, to manage and broadcast information, to be proactive part of IP development, but really which is the key of, uh, of uh, the subject today is to accompany innovation and creation and to do training. So just uh, before entering into details of our program, uh, just want to uh, recall some um, uh, provision that we have in France uh, and we tend to consider ourselves an IP, uh, an IP country also, uh, as I mentioned, land of intellectual property. We have an IP specific tax program, of course, uh, because when it comes to, uh, to to increase IP awareness to companies, we have also to, uh, to stimulate their IP uh, interest. Uh, so most of the time it comes uh, with also a tax credit and, uh, um, and some, some incentives uh, on that part. Um, we develop that, we'll have these uh, uh, services of uh, threefold uh, that is a very uh, e innovative to support uh, SMEs in France. Uh, we draft uh, IP laws, as I mentioned earlier, uh, which is quite interesting is that we, we managed to, to have a new, a new law in France, a new bill passed uh, a few months uh, ago, uh, entered into force uh, on the 1st of uh, March, if I'm not mistaken. This new law called PACT, which is an action plan for growth and uh, transformation of uh, enterprises, um, uh, made some observations. Uh, one which is very interesting, of course, like same uh, most uh, in most countries. Um, only 21% of patent filing was done by SMEs, versus 50% by big corporation. So we needed to have some strong stimulation. Uh, to uh, have this figure increased uh, of patent filing when it comes to patent uh, for, for SMEs. So the whole objective of this uh, PACT law was to support SMEs with a holistic approach uh, to adapt the intellectual property system to new practices, to respond to the needs of all the businesses with more flexible pathways and to strengthen the robustness of the titles, to give more powers to the IPO. Um, so, for instance, uh, just put some of uh, the provisions here that you have in the IP law, which is now in the uh, which are now in the IP code, or well, you know, you know, act. So we uh, have uh, extended the utility certificate from six to ten years because we have a utility certificate in France. Uh, I know it's not the case in India. We created uh, something quite new and uh, a provisional patent application. A provisional patent which is not a patent yet, completely full patent, but it gives a, um, a date of priority uh, and priority to um, to applicants uh, in a light way, uh, so that they can they can you know have a date, and they have uh, more time to to have a full patent uh, application uh, if they succeed in that uh, within uh, twelve uh, months. We also created a patent opposition procedure before the IP office, which is quite new, something that we didn't have. Um, so it reinforced the uh, certainty of the patent and uh, the, uh, it's like sort of IPAB here that you have in India. 
um, and uh, it uh, it enables uh, any applicants to to uh, oppose within the IPO uh, before the IP office and not to go to court systematically, uh, which can which can take of course ages, like like any 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 court procedure, um, most of the time. Um, and uh, we have also created um, a new a new way of um, um, examining patent application uh, by uh, examining criteria of inventiveness. So it will strengthen the patent examination procedure that we we having um, in France. For trademarks, we have created new types of brands. Um, we have also a new opposition procedure for trademark, uh, which was existed before, and the procedure for cancellation and revocation. Uh, so it's something that you have here in India, but we didn't have it in, in France. So now we have a fully operated um, IPO uh, for the benefit of uh, the companies. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, so when it comes to the information and awareness and training program that we have, uh, to the core, of course, uh, uh, of the presentation here. Um, like, you know, uh, the, the circle of innovation is quite, uh, of course, uh, obvious, uh, but we, we tend to consider that uh, from R&D, uh, you have innovation. Now, the two have merged in most of the companies and they, they don't have an R&D uh, department, but they're not an I department. So development becomes uh, uh, obviously innovation most of the time, and we want to create uh, uh, this uh, and to, to to bring life to this innovation by creating uh, an IP rights uh, that will uh, ultimately bring uh, value uh, to the innovators to the companies uh, that has to be completely included in their business strategy. So this is really our man. Uh, motto, and this is how, how, how we go and, and, uh, and see uh, uh, the, the companies that we recommend. So um, we have a strong, one of the biggest department of the, the French IP office is the Directorate for, for Economic Action. So uh, we have four, four main pillars. We, we inform applicants, innovators, we accompany our customers and partners in the use of wealth and creating products, we facilitate networks of partners and businesses, and we increase the knowledge and competence of uh, economic actor. So we accompany uh, corporates and SMEs, uh, we call them customers and partners, uh, but with the objective of wealth creating uh, products. So we really have a proactive um, policy and uh, and now we, 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 we are an active economic pillar of the uh, innovation uh, ecosystem uh, by promoting um, innovation, by developing companies and bringing, uh, bringing value to them. So at every stage of business development, we, we try to uh, put into their mind that IP has to be taken into account to support the activity. IP strategy has to be part of the business strategy from the very beginning uh, of the business plan. So uh, we promote and develop um, um, an IP savvy uh, uh, economic uh, environment in France, um, more than IP awareness, uh, which is quite innovative. Um, we have for that um, an, an IMPI smart grid um, all over the country um, in France with uh, 13 regional um, offices uh, that have a very pragmatic um, approach uh, when it comes to IP uh, uh, awareness program. Uh, we have objectives of uh, set up meetings uh, and visitings uh, and visiting thousands of companies um, every year, every day actually. Uh, we have sort of commercial target for each of my, of my colleagues um, in France. Um, and we visit uh, many SMEs and, uh, and startups, of course. And we propose to accompany them um, in their business strategy uh, with, a, with their IP, um, IP strategy. So we propose um, a range of services um, of threefold. Uh, so we set up this meeting. 
uh, on site. Or IP potential. Sorry. Can you still hear me? Yes. And um, we try to secure the corporate development of these companies uh, and give them a report with some IP uh, recommendation. And then we have a second step, um, which is a called pass uh, IP. Um, which uh, which is uh, here to enforce recommendation uh, uh, with a finality supportive program with several IP experts, and finally uh, for for the one who wants to go a bit further, uh, mainly for the uh, CEOs or or founders of the of the companies, we have a masterclass program, uh, which are training sessions of six days over six months. Uh, to continue building this IP awareness directly targeted to the uh, uh, the main uh, uh, you know driver of the company, uh, the CEO, the CEO himself, um, and uh, at the end we can even uh, increase uh, the uh, the knowledge by uh, having these uh, uh, inventions or patent mapping. Uh, using the big data uh, of the service for the service of the of the innovation strategy. So um, I'm not going to go into detail again, but you will have here exactly what we do uh, when we visit uh, set up meetings uh, with companies. And uh, in 2019, uh, there was uh, more than 120,000 individual cases followed, uh, and more than and 15. You know, SME contacts um, through uh, on site uh, visits or online um, and uh, hotline uh, calls, also, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so we visit SME, but also we have a dedicated you know, program for startups. Uh, we completely part of the, of the innovation ecosystem, as I mentioned earlier, in France. So we're part of what we call the French tech uh, um, ecosystem. Uh, so we we try to promote how IP is important for for a startup. Uh, of course, you all know that, but this is the way we uh, we talk to them. Uh, it uh, it gives value, uh, it gives ability to defend, uh, generate revenues, um, and of course, uh, it, it has to be part of your business strategy, business plan, and uh, it's a good way to talk uh, to uh, any kind of uh, uh, financial institutions or business angels, of course. Um, so that's basically it. I'm very happy to take any questions if you have, and uh, thank you very much again for your invitation. Thank you very much, Mr. Gellard, and uh, thank you for that information. I'm going to now uh, bring in our uh, Honorable President, uh, Mr. Vinod Kumar, and uh, I'm going to introduce him um, so he can uh, also give a brief and uh, take some questions. Mr. Vinod Kumar started out as a technology entrepreneur to lead the development and successful sale of an indigenous uh, developed navigation and geographic information system based tracking patent and business to a Russian space and GIS conglomerate. As an investor, he presently invests in profitable, innovative, small and medium companies. Over to you, Mr. Vinod Kumar. <coughs> Thank you very much, Sushma. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, with friends from all around the world, across, uh, I would say, uh, time zones. <laughs> and um, we have, we, we have a, I mean, amazing crowd. We still have 587 people left on Facebook, and we still have 100 plus uh, people attending the webinar in spite of a three-hour marathon, um, I would say, which, which we are conducting. So first of all, um, I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, the first question that I have here is from a gentleman called Sunil Kumar Agarwal. He is asking us that um, 
is it possible to uh, get one free trademark for each SME uh, so that, you know, there can be more and more people that can get um, sort of trademarks and they can get um, sort of um, eased into this uh, trademark and IP? Well, Mr. Agarwal, let me answer this question for you. The Center for International Property, uh, Intellectual Property uh, Research, Promotion and Facilitation, which is run by the India SME Forum, primarily already has a mechanism with the central government, wherein trademarks, patents, and geographical indications, all of them are reimbursed to you in terms of the costs. All you need to do is visit the website and uh, fill up a form as to what you would want to do. And our uh, person would come back to you with information on what exactly is it that you need to do or what sort of information that we need for you to be able to file a claim for getting. And let me repeat that in Hindi also for uh, our, our audience. The Center for um, Intellectual Property Research Facilitation uh, and Promotion I am going to say the government of India is not going to be able to trademarks, ho, intellectual property, ke patents, or uh, geographical indicators. In the reimbursement of the uh, government of India, if you have a trademark, mil gaya, uske baad, you get reimbursed for the costs. So, you have a trademark, you have a Indian patent, you have a international patent. Do lakh rupee tak, so uh, like that, and uh, so on and so forth. Also for geographical indicator. So, so that that's the first question that I encountered here. I have a question which I'd like to um, put to Tamara. Um, this question is about, uh, sir, um, how uh, do trade? How do people which are primarily uh, making software applications, which are built on open source platforms? How do we uh, safeguard our intellectual property rights, through, whether through a patent or trademark? So I'd like uh, Tamara to please, uh, you know, uh, ans answer this question. You have given me the hardest question to answer. <laughs> 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 because this is a very tricky, um, if it's open source, uh, this is not my area of expertise at all. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not in the substantive fields of IP. But open source, by nature, the whole idea is that you make uh, the code open to all, and that is the that is the, the contract that you have when you en when you engage with open source. So if you want to use the open source and then you create um, what you call improvements to it, and then you want to patent that improvement as your own, I, I think that would be going against the whole uh, whole um, objective of open source. But, well, um, but also what can happen is, for example, uh, let's say we have um, uh, operating systems which are, which are formed, for example, the Android operating system. And there's a set of programmers which is working on the, that Android open system, open source system to finally make an application on top of it. So uh, I think that is what the question is about. So if the guy was to make an application on top of it to work with the open source platform, my feeling is, uh, you know, for the app part of it, there could be uh, the possibility of getting a copyright or a patent because uh, the, though the software or the platform is open source, what he's built on top of it. Uh, um, so there, there are quite a few examples of this. For example, you know, all the apps that we get that work basically on Android or on the Apple uh, um, operating system. So. Uh, all of these guys uh, are primarily, um, uh, you know, owners of that bit of, uh, you know, uh, code that they have created, which is on top of this platform. So uh, there are times when, for example, they get um, paid for, uh, or they, they get subscribers to pay for them. So I'm sure there must be some uh, mechanism. Uh, but those are not open source. I mean, if you go to Android and these are not open source software. Uh, so that's there's a difference there. But if you're if you're using Linux or something like that, and uh, I think the I think the I think the whole uh, what you call the exchange is that you use the platform, but then you have to make it available whatever you improve to others to be able to improve as well. But like I said, this is not my area of expertise, so I, I defer to 
other our other experts on the panel uh, who are uh, available, I think, who might be able to uh, contribute to this. Sure. Question. Would 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 Hera like to come in and uh, to take, take uh, give us some insight if she if she does? Yeah, I can just comment to that that uh, of course with the software pat patents they are not uh, patentable everywhere. You know that depends on the which jurisdiction you have to go. I think in India softwares are not allowed as persons 3K, so you cannot really patent software in India. You can I think protect it uh, by copyright as such uh, because it's a very thin, it's a code. Very correct. Very in correct. terms of in terms of Europe, I think Jed might correct me if I'm mistaken. Uh, the software is not up, not patentable than either. It used to be in US. Whether that's still the case, I'm not really sure right now. But in India, yeah, you can't can't have it patented. Yeah. Uh, so Jed, uh, Jed Owen, uh, would you would you have a perspective? Of what do you guys do uh, over in Europe with something like this? You well, know, is we, it we... copyright or can you also do a patent? Well, we only deal with patents. So the copyright issue is always there. Copyright protection is always a possibility. Um, and it depends on many aspects in open source, such as the open source licenses, because I'm not an expert in this particular field, but there are many different open source licenses uh, types. Some of them require you to do uh, to everything that you've developed, you require to make that open as well to other people as well. Um, some of them are open source platforms which you can use, but you can use them partially to, to develop solutions which you then may decide are novel and inventive and you may want to patent them anyway yourself. You're not allowed to patent a software program as such under European law. Um, what we rely on is the concept that there's a technical effect. So basically, Typically, if you talk about cars and the braking systems in cars, the automatic anti-lock systems, for instance, they are very, very well developed and highly developed these days. And they use complex computer algorithms, depending on the temperature, the humidity, whether it's raining or not, the surface of the road, etc., cetera, um, to optimize the braking. And the, the invention is in the algorithm itself, but you can't patent the algorithm itself. You patent basically the combination of the brake, the control mechanism, and the algorithms behind that control mechanism. And altogether, there you have a technical effect, a technical effect which makes itself visible in natural science ways, better braking, more friction, uh, less blocking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we always have this computer implemented invention concept. It's an invention, it's, inve it's implemented with the use of computers to optimize it, um, and you patent the whole thing, not just the algorithm. And one of the points of this is if you were to patent the algorithm, you would have very, very broad protection. And we consider it would be too broad protect protection for what you've disclosed as an invention. So you've disclosed a better breaking system, you have protection on a better, better breaking system and not the algorithm, which could be too broad. So we exactly. always go back to the computer implemented invention concept and that is patentable. Sometimes they will have a lot of open source code in them. Uh, and that has simply been a tool used to help create that invention in the first place. But if the invention is new and it's surprising uh, and it's, it's not obvious, then it is patentable in that physically implemented form. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That was a, that was a uh, pretty uh, clear explanation there. I mean, I, I, I sometimes feel a lot of software guys in India may actually head out to Europe for getting most of the stuff patented because you have you offer better protection there. So, uh, you know, the other question that I have is uh, from Dr. Archana Chaudhary. She asked that uh, there's this utility model protection for small innovation, um, uh, like uh, in China, uh, duration of time, and it's easy to get um, compared to a patent. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I don't know much about this. Uh, would uh, uh, one of our esteemed panelists take, take up this? What is the utility model protection for small innovation, uh, which, is, uh, which exists in countries like China? Well, does it exist in India? No. <laughs> so if I add to that, India doesn't have a utility model of protection, but they, uh, we have in the Indian pattern agri called design. The design would have to have, except for the design of the particular invention, they would have to have some technical element to it. 
I, I never practice in, in Europe, so I am not able to tell you what would be the actual difference because my whole experience in IPR is actually from India. So I would not be able to tell you what is the actual difference between the utility model as per the European perception. Oh, Jet might know. <laughs> and, and, and the Indian design. So again, Jet, because he has been in India uh, so long, so he will be probably the best person to, to talk about it. Yeah. You know, in fact, we do have something which is, which is like the Design Act, wherein yeah. uh, we can register a design you primarily. Can. Um, yeah, it's, for, it's for 10 years, but what is the exact difference when you look at what the Europeans consider as a utility model and what the Indian Patent Act consider as a design application? What is the difference? What is the scope of the protection that I'm not able to tell you that maybe Jet might be more, more aware about that? Just say a few comments on it. In the Euro European Patent Office, we don't have a utility model. Uh, that's very clear. So in Europe, we have the national patent offices. And the utility model is a, a lower form of technical protection, like a patent. So it also protects a technical effect effectively, like a patent does, whereas a design protects aesthetic aspects of something, um, such as the rounded cases on a smartphone, as the Apple designs originally were protected. Um, what you've got in many European states is you have a utility model, as well as a patent, just as you have in China itself. And um, for instance, in Germany, a utility model, Gebrauchsmuster, will be for 10 years only. It will not usually be examined unless it is challenged. It's very, very cheap and it's published straight away, not after 18 months. So it's a different type of protection. It's published straight away, so you have provisional protection straight away. It's not examined, therefore it's a much less robust type of IP right. Um, but it, of course you can, and have it examined if you pay the extra fees, if you actually wish to use it for um, infringement proceedings against somebody. And so it's used quite a lot by smaller companies. But the European Patent Office, if you like, deals with the higher value patents, and therefore we don't deal with unitary patents. Whether a country wants to have utility models as well as a patent, it's really up to them. But it's often seen as a thing which can help um, the innovation with smaller companies in particular. Uh, which might need smaller, less expensive, but faster IP protection. But that's very much um, within the policy of every country to decide that independently. And some European countries have it and some don't. But it is worth mentioning that Germany has it. And Germany is a very strong patenting country. I think this is something that the Indian government would have to investigate for yourselves and decide whether it would help innovation or hinder innovation within your own particular country. The next question, thank you, Jet. The next question that I have is, I have uh, Chirag asking about, uh, I have a patent which I filed in Jan 2020, uh, which, which I um, had filed in October 2017. Can I get reimbursement on the cost that I've incurred? Yes, Chirag, you can get a full reimbursement of the cost, normally um, up to a lakh of rupees, that's 100,000 rupees, you can get reimbursed. Please connect with us and we can help you process the application. In fact, let me share here. Uh, last year, we've helped 1,100 uh, the trademarks get registered in India, and out of which, uh, which, which have been applied for, for registration, which have got approved. And there are many more which, have, which are still in the process, and uh, we, we, we are working on most of them. I have another question here. I'm not sure whether this is a question or not, but this is Priyanka. And she says that um, we practice uh, IPR in North India with specialization in trademarks. There should be cross-border IPR awareness programs for Indian IPR uh, lawyers and practitioners so they can further disseminate the game knowledge amongst. Well, Priyanka, this is the reason why we are holding something like this today. But I'm sure we tried to do this over one uh, marathon, three-hour session, which in the future we are going to bring down, hopefully, and do smaller sessions. But we'll involve everybody that we have today and we will invite all of you again so this is this is just the beginning of something that we that we that we felt is required and we will we will look at it in the future also um i have another gentleman called mr surya narayan he's saying that um i'm part of uh, an invention and uh, my previous co-founder in the invention or co-inventor is not interested to go forward with it can I change part of it or can I change its name and apply again for examination? Uh, 
<laughs> that's a dicey question because if, of the two people, Surya Narayan, if uh, the other gentleman that you worked with and he's not interested, I'm, I'm sure unless you get a no objection certificate from the guy, you will not be able to um, change the name or reapply for an exam. Um, so I, I think that, that would be it. And uh, for today, I think this is very sorry, this you, is you very procedural. Talk. This is very procedural matter. I'm not sure which, whether non-objection certificate would be sufficient or whether you would have to have a proper assignment, assignment. of rights. Maybe you know that we have to go to local, like a, I mean, a lawyer, and actually ask about it. But I think you might have to need more than non-objection certificate. Yeah. Cool. So Shmaji, I'm, I'm through with questions for today. I think we were overrun. We crossed the 7 p.m. deadline, so uh, I'm back back to you. But I, it was a pleasure interacting with all of you. Such uh, amazing knowledge that all of you have shared with us, and we would love to, um, you know, conduct this on a more regular basis. And uh, also with Hannah, the fact that you know, you t we are, we've been talking about Indo-European collaboration for quite some time now. We've in fact last year uh, enabled six companies from Europe to come to India and work with Indian entrepreneurs. And out of them, one of them has already set up uh, a joint venture manufacturing uh, plant in uh, South India in uh, Andhra Pradesh, which is an investment, joint investment of around $11 million. So we would, I would, uh, in my own capacity and as the president of the India SME Forum, wish to thank all of you for your time. And the fact that you were inclined to come over and share information with us all, only tells us that the world is actually getting smaller and and much more closer than ever before so thank you very much sushma back to you thank you very much sir and um, i would like to um, express uh, the most uh, sincerest and humblest uh, gratitude to all the esteemed speakers present here on the panel today uh, and thank you very much for being so patient and uh, so, so patiently sitting through three hours uh, and uh, answering all the questions in fact, I'm sure we are going to receive more questions on Facebook and uh, there are more questions being received on my email ID. So I will be uh, compiling those questions and sending out uh, to uh, all the panelists here as well for their uh, expert comments. And uh, we will be in touch for more such uh, uh, future programs uh, uh, very, very soon. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Burkel, uh, Mr. Gaylard, uh, Mr. Owens, Mr. On Ms. Ondrakova, and uh, Ms. Tamara. Thank you very much. Please convey my uh, regards and thanks to Mr. Minier also. Uh, thank you very much once again. Good evening and good night. Thank you very, very much. Good and afternoon, thanks. good night. Thanks to all the participants and uh, viewers who have been uh, connected with us today and tuned to this uh, conference. Thank you very much and uh, please stay in touch. Keep safe always and take care. Bye.